Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 24th, 2020 edition of the Sands Internet Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. A couple updates from the Internet Storm Center. First, a diary post that we have from Xavier. Now, one of the tricky things with threat intelligence is always how do you make it actually actionable? And Xavier here has a little set of scripts that he's using in order to export data from his MISP server to PFSense in order to use it as a block list. MISP is a rather popular open source threat intelligence platform and uh, very good at sharing information with others and importing, exporting, of course, in various formats. And that's kind of uh, what Xavier is going for here to show you how to export this data to then import it as a block list in PFSense. Now, talking about threat intelligence, I have been experimenting with a new sort of data feed uh, for our data that essentially lists uh, all IP addresses from which we have seen either significant activity from the firewall log shared with you or activity from our SSH sensors, web sensors, or any other third-party feeds that we are collecting. So kind of a unified threat intel feed for all the data we have. It's not very large because I try to limit it to sort of some of the more significant data we have. It's definitely not a block list because, for example, one of the pieces of data we collect is whether or not an IP is being used as a name server for a top-level domain, which can also be useful to enrich your data. And that's really how it's supposed to be used if you do have a SIEM or some uh, system like this where you are investigating your logs. You can use this feed to sort of add additional attributes to IP addresses. This is strictly sort of in beta right now, so the format may change. And what I'm really looking for at this point is feedback to see how useful this is and how we should change it. And then, of course, the URL for the feed will be in the show notes. Well, and if you do have an Asus Tech router, you may want to double check for firmware updates, but do so carefully. The AC1900P router suffers from an insecure firmware update vulnerability. Apparently, the router just uses the simple utility wget to download the firmware, which in itself is not that bad, but they are using it with the no check certificate option, which will essentially disable any authentication and integrity protection that you usually get from TLS and allow for machine in the middle attacks. And in addition, the release node dialog also suffers from a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So an attacker could then probably use the malicious firmware to exploit that. Now, it looks like in the ACES case, it was pretty straightforward to find this vulnerability. All it took was really dumping strings out of the firmware and then looking for this particular suspect uh, string that's typical for wget. Often modern firmware is encrypted, which makes it much more difficult to reverse engineer it and with that to find vulnerabilities. Well, but D-Link just made it a lot easier for researchers that are investigating its firmware. D-Link firmware is usually encrypted, but apparently by mistake, D-Link made available an unencrypted image that also still included the encryption key, and that can now be used to decrypt other versions of firmware that used the same encryption key. Security researcher Nick Stark, who has a good history in finding vulnerabilities in various routers, has a walkthrough in his blog about how he sort of analyzed this and how he came across this key. And to round out our network device vulnerabilities, we also have an advisory from Cisco regarding its adaptive security blind software and firepower threat defense software. Cisco rates this vulnerability as high, but it's, well, only, I guess, uh, web services read-only path traversal vulnerability. 
Public exploit code is however available for this vulnerability and of course these path traversal vulnerabilities tend to be reasonably straightforward to exploit. Cisco also notes that this vulnerability cannot be used to obtain access to ASA or FTD system files or underlying operating system files. So the amount of data that can be leaked here is maybe a little bit limited. In the past, of course, we have seen some vulnerabilities like this being used to then further exploit the devices. If any secrets like session IDs or such were readable via directory traversal. Well, that's it for today. And well, if you haven't done so yet, uh, then please subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast software. And if there's any kind of location where I should post this podcast, uh, please let me know. Thanks and talk to you again on Monday.